Well, hey, it's Rob, and uh, I just got to talk to one of my guitar heroes of all time. That would be Mike Slamer of the band City Boy. City Boy was an English rock band in the 70s, early 80s. I got into them because I heard them on uh, American Top 40. Uh, their big song was 5705 here in the States and around the world. And uh, I've been running one of their Facebook pages for over a decade now, but uh, this is the first time I've actually got to talk to Mike, and I did that over Zoom today, so uh, let's see what he has to say, and I hope you enjoy this. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. I know yeah. Sue uh, mentioned to you that uh, my memory isn't that good these days, so... <laughs> That's well, you were there, so you're going to know more than me, but uh, t tell Susan thank you for, for setting this up, too. And, sure, will do. And uh, so I will uh, just start off by saying I'm Rob. I'm a huge City Boy fan. Uh, I'm an audio engineer here in Atlanta. I work on shows like uh, The Walking Dead and Stranger Things, do TV and film, that kind of stuff. Okay. And maybe, I don't know, a dozen years ago, <laughs> I started a City Boy uh, Facebook page. There are a couple of them out there, but uh, right. I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm the only American one. I'm not sure where the other one's based. But uh, anyway, and it's been great because, of course, Chris Dunn and Steve are pretty active on Facebook. So they've been out there sharing old pictures and cool things like the demos you did at Zella, things that I never would have heard otherwise. Oh, wow. So it's been great over the years seeing all that stuff. But uh, the reason I wanted to talk to you is that uh, in 1978, two things happened for me. One, I started playing guitar. Okay. You, were, you were one of the first guitar players that I looked up to and admired. And oh, number you. two, and uh, number two, I heard uh, 5705 on American Top 40 with Casey Kasem. And I think it was right at like number 40 or 39. So it was right at the beginning of the show. And uh, I was hooked. So, of course, I went out and bought Book Early on 8-track oh, tape, Wow, which I still own. And so, you know, the 12-year-old boy inside of me is flipping out a little bit, like, Mike Slamer is the guy inside this tape. And somehow, <laughs> I, 45 years later, I get to talk to him. So so thank you for doing this. Well, I hope you're not disappointed yet. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm already not disappointed. But okay. uh, anyway, so just to start off, uh, <clears throat> I know you you did a great podcast that's on YouTube that people can hear, which was very exhaustive about your whole life. When you started playing guitar, everything you did after. Uh, for me today, because I just have a limited amount of time and then Zoom's going to cut me off. I just wanted to cover just the City Boy years and maybe just start with you telling me how you got involved with the guys in City Boy and started to make music with them. Uh, well, the guys, I think uh, when I joined, there was already Chris, Max, Lol, and Steve <clears throat> were in the band. Um, and it was called Back in the Band. I'm sure you know this story. Um, and I just quit college. I was doing an engineering course, which I didn't want to continue. And so um, I thought, if I'm going to be a guitar player, I need to be in the biggest music store in town and whatever. And there was a shop there called uh, Jones and Crossland. And uh, Chris was already working there. So I went in one day and just uh, met the manager and said, can I have a job, <laughs> you know, working in the music store? And to cut a long story short, that's where I met Chris. <clears throat> and uh, what, what, what were your jobs at, at Jones and Crossland, both of you? Uh, mine was selling guitars and amps and, and Chris too, yeah. So uh, we worked in the same department. Um, and then uh, after probably five, six months, he asked me if I knew a bass player because they were going to do some demos. His band were going to do some demos. And did I know a bass player? And I said, no, not really, but I'll come and play bass if you like, you know. So the first demo we did um, as an electric band with a drummer that I knew who was coming into the shop occasionally, uh, Roger Kent. Sure. Um, right. So me and Roger went down to this place out in the country, this studio, and I played bass and he played drums. And that was the first demo we did. I was the bass player. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 
this is a story you hear a lot in rock bands. Who's going to play bass? And, you know, any, mini, miny, mo, uh, you yeah. do it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I was a bass player for those first, uh, that first demo or so. But then the man, the guy that was managing us, uh, Rene, he wanted, uh, he wanted a couple of guitar, he wanted guitar solos on these songs. That's from what I remember. It's, it's pretty vague. And I know Chris was playing and he wasn't particularly happy with what Chris was doing because Chris was more of a, a picker. And uh, so I said, well, I'll do something if you want me to. So I went in and played a couple of solos and the manager said, okay, you're on guitar, Chris, you're playing bass. <laughs> <And that was it. laughs> How did Chris take it? I don't remember. I think he was quite, I think he was cool about it. I, I just don't remember. But um, I, I mean, it didn't stop him playing guitar because he did nearly all the acoustic and picking stuff on all the albums and whatever. So, uh, right, I know I, he did the, um, the great know. finger picking stuff on what Haymaking yeah. Time and Ambition, all those oh, nice yeah, finger, finger pick stuff. parts. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and then you went on from there. So you you were back in the band, then you had some other silly name, and then it finally <laughs> became City Boy. City Boy, yeah, and then. Uh, then the rest is history, you know. Right. Uh, I know you, you got know the deal. You, pretty I know quick, you huh? wanted to know about what guitars I was playing back then. I think absolutely. That's my next question right here. Okay. I think when we did the demos, I'm trying to remember. I think I had a part Grimshaw, less poor copy. Mm -hmm. um, it was a weird sort of sunburst green color. Um, a green burst. Yeah, green burst, and. Uh, but then after that, I think by the time we got out, we went to, uh, where did we go to? The Manor to do the first album. By the time we, we cut the first album, um, I bought my first uh, Les Paul, proper Les Paul, which I have here still. Um, so Is that the one in the video? It's a sunburst or something? There it is, right next to the SG. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out. Yes. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, and then I played the list for, I think, for a couple of years. But then the more gigs we did and the more rehearsing we did, it was just such a heavy guitar, you know. So I wanted something lighter that was, uh, you know, a little more comfortable on stage. So then I bought that SG and uh, then, that, then that became my main guitar from ever since. I still play it today. Played it all no. through the seats and everything, yeah. And that SG, does it have a Kaler or something on it? Uh, the, my second one does. This one actually is a little weird because, um, let me, I'll show you what, what's going on with this. There's a guy in Birmingham called John Birch. Right. So he set up a whole different bridge system for me because I had the, the Rosewood fingerboard replaced with an ebony fingerboard with Les Paul frets because I wanted it to feel like the Les Paul. So this guitar uh, guy, he, uh, he, he basically, he mainly worked on acoustics. He built me this, uh, this, uh, this, this fingerboard and uh, put the frets in. And uh, then, then the bridge didn't work. So John Birch put a bridge in for me because this, is, this has no rate, very little radius, um, the fretboard. Um, and so this is it. And, the only thing that's different is the pickups aren't the stuff. Are, the, are those super super distortion? No, just okay. just the middle ones. Uh, the yeah, not the super distortion. PAF. I, I can't remember. Demacio PAF. So yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I had a '61 uh, SG. It was my first real guitar. <laughs> oh yeah. And the the thing you notice about SGs is people can't help but messing with them. Like you never see a 70s or even a 60s SG, which they haven't torn the bridge off or changed the pickups or the machine right. heads. It, it seems like everyone wanted to experiment on those, you know, guitars, but the Les Pauls, they left them alone. Like they were too pretty, you know, you didn't want to right, you right. Know, well, the, uh, dig up uh, one of those. Yeah, my, uh, when I, after, after City Boy, when I joined Streets, I wanted a second SG. Uh, so I had a backup on stage and that's the one that has the Kaler on it. So, um, so, but my uh, Les Paul's a 71, the SG is a 74, and my other SG is a 78. So. And of course we have to, I'll jump ahead to the elephant in the room, which is the video guitar, which is the double cutaway guitar, the white Les Paul with the double cut. And nobody, I think, including you knows what it is. 
No, I don't either. And I was going to pull, try and get that out for you, but it's in my garage under so much stuff with some <laughs> old guitars that I haven't played in decades. And uh, I went in last night and I thought, oh, God, I, I've got to move so much stuff. So I didn't get it out. But I know it's in pieces anyway, yeah. um, because uh, I, I only used it for about a year or so. I know it's in the top of the Pops uh, 5705 video. I think it's in the 5705 video. It, it is um, in the 5705 video. Right. And actually, uh, sorry. Oh, I was going to just jump ahead for a second. In the 5705 video, it sounds like you're playing guitar live. Do you have any idea why that's the case? No. So if you, if you listen, it's the <laughs> it's the backing tracks and the strings, and yeah. it's Steve, it's Steve faking the the lead vocal, which of course we know you know Roy Ward sang it, and yeah. it's you pl you playing that double cut. But when you play the solo, you're playing it in a lower octave. I mean, it's clearly a different guitar track. You can hear the chords sound different, but just you. And I think maybe Lal, a couple of things that he's singing or something, backing tracks on. So there are a couple of things that sound a little different. And then the rest sounds like it's just the studio, you know, recording. So it's, it's I know, very, I know, very strange. We, uh, yeah, I mean, I know, I know we, we you know, basically mime to the thing, uh, lip sync to it, but I remember so little about that, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, I don't even remember remember the clothes I wore. I mean, I, and somebody showed me that um, 5705 video a couple of years ago. And that's the first time I realized that I wasn't actually playing my SG or Les Paul. So, and I go, oh my, that's that guy in New York built me that, you know. <clears throat> so it was well, I know, me. I know in one of those videos, you're wearing an MSU shirt. And so I went to Michigan State University. So I'm like, it's got to be Michigan State <laughs> University. Maybe it is. I don't know. That's why I wore it, because I knew this had happened one day. So. Right, 45 yeah. years later. But yeah, so yeah. The, the double cut is interesting. There's a guy named Bill Lewis in New York who made these double cut guitars. And Gilmore plays one on Dark Side of the Moon. But it doesn't look like oh. yours. It, it's a double right. cut, but it do doesn't look like yours. I know your guy was from New York. Yeah. But Ace Freely has a double cut, which looks exactly like yours, except the switch is by the knobs. It's not on the lower bout. And that was made by a guy in Memphis at a store called Strings and Things. And he made, I don't know, a dozen of those double cut Les Pauls. And that's the one that really looks like yours. But who knows? That's wow. Now, that's weird. I have a Strings and Things that was built for me when I, when I was in streets. It's right. a black, and it looks like a Brian May. I had it the Brian May shape. And uh, a lot of people ask me about that guitar because it's such an unusual looking guitar. Um, so that's funny. But no, this was definitely built for me in New York. And I know I played it uh, on a few shows during the tour while we were in New York at that point. And then obviously when we got back to the UK on the video or the other way around, I can't remember. Um, the only thing about that guitar that I remember why I didn't play it that much is I had an incredibly thin neck and it just, I just wasn't that comfortable with it. I like, I like a slightly thicker rounder neck. It was a very flat, thin neck. So, uh, but uh, anyway. <laughs> you think it's on any of the City Boy recordings at all? I don't think it is. Uh, the only guitars I ever used on the recordings were these two. Um, and I used to have a strap. So, um, those are the only three guitars that I ever used. So, and so if, if we're hearing electric guitar on any City Boy record, that's that's all you, right? Nobody else would have been playing electric. Um, <clears throat> as you know, Mutt Lang produced this, so it's hard to say. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, <laughs> he, he might have been playing. I know he played uh, bass. Did he? Did he play guitar too? Uh, he did a little bit. I think I think he played a bit of rhythm on uh, Hapkido Kid. In fact, I'm sure he did, because he had he asked me if he said, "Could you do something like this?" And I said, "Well, it sounds really good with you doing it." So he did it, <laughs> right? Um, and so the problem became Steve just mentioned when you played Hap Keto live, Steve had to play that little rip, and he yeah. said he, he was frozen in place and nervous because <laughs> he didn't feel like he was good enough to pull it off live, and he had to do it because you know it was in the song. Yeah, because I was doing the wah parts and everything. So, yeah, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, but I mean, other than that, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I spent hours in the studio with Mutt and, uh, you know, he was, <clears throat> he was tough. I loved working for him and I learned so much during the years that he produced us. It was just like going to college and, uh, it was, it was absolutely amazing, but, uh, but he did make you work for it. So, uh, well, he, he got great stuff for sure. I mean, what the stuff that I love about your playing, like I said, I've been listening since this point. <laughs> I even have this one too, the uh, the first uh, City Fabulous. Boy on 8-Track uh, and, and all the records and, and everything else. But if you listen, I mean, everything that you're playing is a part. You're very rarely strumming along the chords or just blocking them out or whatever. You've got a little part. You've got a little two-note part or something. A lot of it is kind of, muted or choked off or kind of laying down there in the mix but then when the chorus comes those big power chords come in so it's it's so dynamic and expressive i mean was that the kind of stuff that was on your mind is like you know creating yeah like i mean all my soundscape parts, yeah i mean i used to say to lon and steve when i would come up with the guitar parts you know I and mean, how about something like this and normally they would go yeah yeah fine and I didn't like strumming, you know, it was, you know, if I'm going to play, I want it to be a part, like, like you said. So, and I've pretty much always been that way. So, um, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because I think uh, Steve was the strummer and Steve plays that great 12 string part at the, uh, the end of Beth on this record. All right. And uh course chris was like the picker and he did all that cool finger picking stuff so you all had your little roles and the, and the things you did i think steve even played mandolin on uh, yeah shake my head and leave you know so you all had the yeah. your little specialties in the band that you did no absolutely yeah i think so i agree so here's a question if i see a writing credit and your name is on the list is it uh you know necessarily that it's a song you brought in or a song that you got credit on because you added to it or who, who would come up with the original ideas and bring the songs in my, i think most of the stuff that my name would be on would be me coming in and adding extra bits um there's maybe half a dozen songs over the whole period that i probably brought in at the most um until uh, I mean, I'm saying that during the first four or five albums. I don't mean after after the breakup. Um, I'm talking pre-breakup. So uh, most of it was Lol Steve and Max. Um, I mean, they always wear the hub of City Boy in the writing and, and whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I just sort of contributed mainly. Now, did, did Lol play anything? Lol, no. Yeah. No, just the full, so... I'm kidding. And, <laughs> well, and, and he is greatly missed for sure. But, oh, uh, I know. I know. I'm, I'm just so grateful that I saw him shortly before that happened, you know, yeah. and we sat in the pub and had some, had a few pints. Uh, it was great. And uh, yeah. I value that. Sure. So when you guys recorded, I mean, did you do basic tracks as a band? Was it done more like piecemeal? It was done pretty much piecemeal. I'm not sure it was on the first album. We had to do that so quickly um, at the Manor House in Oxford. Um, I think we had a week to do the whole damn thing. Um, so, yeah. I think it says on the, on the back of the record here, <laughs> recorded in a week or something. Yeah, I yeah. So, I, I think it was, yeah. Um, yeah, re no, recorded, that, recorded in a week at the Manor Studios in Oxford. Yeah, there you go. Um, that's a bit of a blur. It all happened so fast. Um, but uh, I think I, I think from dinner at the Ritz, because I think we had two or three weeks at Rockfield for that one. Um, and that's when I think we started to do more of the piecemeal, you know, uh, let's get the drums and bass right, and then the rhythm guitar, and then this, and then that. No. Uh, have, you, have you seen the documentary about Rockfield? No, no. Oh, it's very good. <laughs> you should see it. It's the, it's the original studio owners and walking around the studio, and of course, all the stuff they did with queen and everyone yeah. else that recorded there through the years i'm, I'm sure you'd love it you recorded there so yeah yeah oh i love that place yeah it was great so and then the, it, with the yeah, amplifiers i think when i joined streets uh, when i joined city boy um i had a laney a uh, hundred 
which was way too loud for the band at that point. And so I think by the time, I know by the time we did Dinner at the Ritz, I'd got rid of the Laney. May, may even been for the first album, I'd got rid, and I bought a trainer, a 212 trainer combo. Um, and that sort of worked out okay for a while. And then um, once we started doing bigger shows and stuff, um, I got a couple of Marshalls, 250s, and split them up in stereo. And I kept that rig. I still have those amps. I still have the cabinets. I still use them on most of the stuff that I do. Well, I th uh, Tony Iommi's SG, I think, was John Birch. Wasn't he the guy that built that for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he probably used Laney's too. You guys had like the same setup, but of course, <laughs> yeah. like a totally different sound, you know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so those are the only three amps I ever used um, in, uh, in, in City Boy was the... Maybe I didn't even record with the Laney. I, you know, I don't even remember. So it was probably just the trainer, 212, and then the Marshalls. And as far as effects, I mean, when you listen to almost any track on a City Boy record, and I can just, you know, pull one up at random or whatever, uh, Mutt has something going on on your guitars. You've got phasing or chorus oh, yeah. or delay or whatever. Was that, uh, would it have been recorded during, you know, the tracks? Was it no. added later? Was it added something? Later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that no, was we, something... we, we cut all the guitar parts, you know, just bare bones. And then depending on what gear was in the studio, he used to like to try, you know, various various effects on them and, and stuff. So, and a live, I think I only used a chorus and a wah-wah pedal. That, that was the only two things I used live. So um, I didn't, I never had the, you know, the rack of gear or the foot pedals full of, all the stuff that was on the record, um, just just a chorus and a wah wah pedal. I think that was it. And you know the solo of five seven oh five, which is like the greatest eight bars in <laughs> rock and roll. What, what can you tell me about that? Do you have any idea what effects are on that? I mean, that thing just jumps out of that record. It's just like a huge, you know, colossal sounding solo. Maybe it's doubled under a lower octave or doubled with the keyboard or there's something going on in that solo. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, that, that was definitely the Marshall and the SG. Um, and like I said, I never used pedals except for a chorus and a, a just a chorus and a wah, wah but I never used to use them in the studio. It was just, you know, the uh, the 87 and the 57, you know, Mike and the, the amp, the cabinet and the Marshall, that was it. And then whatever Mutt did to it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, like, like most people say, oh, it's all in the fingers. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. I can play a guitar and play the same notes. It's not going to not going to sound the same at all. So uh, since 5705, you know, was the big hit, you know, at least if uh, anyone in the United States heard City Boy, they heard 5705. Uh, do you know any of the backstory? Of course, it started out as a different song and then how it changed and became yeah. what it was. Yeah, I mean... I'm sure Steve would have told you about that, you know, the turn on to Jesus and then it turned into 5705 because they said it would never get released in America called turn on to Jesus. So, um, you know, that the song changed and I mean, I remember, I remember coming up, well, I remember sitting down with Steve and coming up with the riff for the verse. Um, but other than that, I don't remember much about the recording, to be honest with you. Um, I think Mutt and Steve and Lyle had already decided that was going to be the single. And so, you know, they, they were the ones that spent most of the time in the control room and putting that thing together. And uh, I think on that song, I just turned up and played the, the rhythm guitar and part and the solo. So Yep. I'm just wondering if, if the track was re-recorded you know, to turn into 5705 or did they just erase the vocal and put a, put a different vocal on there? Because I've heard a demo that sounds totally different and then another demo of Turn On To Jesus that's a little later, that kind of sounds pretty much like the studio recording. Oh so. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I wish I remembered, but I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> no idea. No. Yeah. It's a mystery. So, so. Yeah. So the other interesting thing, of course, was as the band developed and you lost a couple of members, we had 
this record. The bowling, yeah. And you ended up playing bass again. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you, so you did all the, all the bass, I assume, and all the guitars on that at yeah. that point. Because yeah. Yeah. the other two people that left were the two people that did the other guitar stuff for the earlier yeah, records. Exactly. So exactly. They yeah. They wouldn't have been there anymore. No, no. I mean, uh, I think I played um, a short scale Fender bass on that record. We picked one up. I think we picked one up from somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah, but again, it's a little cloudy, but I think it was yeah. a, sh a short scale Fender uh, bass that I played on that. And I think, my, and we didn't have any bass amps, so it would just be direct. Um, so that would be the story on the bass on that record. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, I'll tell you my funny story very quick is that I jumped in at book early and then I got the earlier stuff. And then the day the earth caught fire came out. Oh my God, that record is even like, you know, another level from book early, although book early will always be my favorite. And then this one came out and I bought it and it was so different. I called the record store. Now I was 14 at the time. And I said, <laughs> I don't like it. Can I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they said, you know, no, they're probably still laughing about that. But uh, I've learned to enjoy it like the rest of the City Boy records. But, it, you know, it certainly was, you know, a change stylistically and, and, you know, the way the songs were written and everything. Do you know oh, yeah. that that Speechless on this record is huge in the Philippines? No idea, no. If you look on Spotify, it has over 2 million plays and it is a wow. huge karaoke song in the philippines the song speechless which i think max and uh and lal wrote yeah and and uh it's your second biggest song under 5705 5705 has four million plays on spotify and speechless is right under it with two million plays wow and wow. for some reason it's a song that like people in the philippines love to sing karaoke to and you can hear a karaoke instrumental version or a bunch of them if you look on YouTube. So somehow that song, which I never even paid attention to at the time, you know, has has caught on with people in the Philippines. It's very strange. Never do that. That's, that, that's outrageous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So here's another question, and I'm going to regret asking this. <laughs> so uh, am I going to regret it? <laughs> no, I'm going to regret it. Okay. I already know it. So Chris did a podcast uh, called The Hustle, where he talked about City Boy. I connected him to this guy named John who does this cool podcast about behind the scenes stuff in the music business. And so I fed John a couple of questions. This was one of the ones I had John ask Chris and Chris said, I don't know. <laughs> so Chris, okay. sounded Chris sounded annoyed by the question, but maybe you have a different answer. So okay. if, you listen, if you listen to the melody in the chorus of 5705, na, 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 na. And like some of the stuff at the end of like cigarettes, that last two minutes, your guitar jam, which is the greatest thing ever. It sounds almost Middle Eastern or Indian. Like the scale is definitely not like the pentatonic blue scale. Do you know why there's any kind of Middle Eastern or Indian sounding stuff on City Boy Records? No, <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, I was never... Um... I was never schooled in all the uh, all the scales, so I would just play what would come into my head um, and the riffs and the and the licks. It would just be whatever whatever I heard in my head at the time. So yeah. uh, it wasn't oh this is you know an F minus seventh or whatever, and so these have to be the notes because I wasn't schooled. I had learned to play by ear completely. So it would just be whatever my my ear wanted to hear is what I play. So unfortunately, yeah, I mean, <laughs> some some of it I guess reminds me of uh, Richie Blackmore, maybe who yeah. you know would play some of stuff, and and maybe it came from that. I'm getting a little button on my screen here. Yeah, this is so oh, I am too. Let time left. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's telling me I want to upgrade my uh, <laughs> my Zoom. It's trying to get me to pay some money. Oh, but, okay. Uh, no, well, well, I mean that 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 could very well be because um, the, at least the first two Deep Purple albums, especially Deep Purple in Rock, Blackmore was a was a big influence on me with that record. Um, so yeah, I mean maybe, 
maybe it comes from that, you know, so that influence. Well, if, you, if, if you listen to the last line in cigarettes with the one that echoes and, and repeats at the end, that's that's the one I'm hearing that sounds Middle Eastern. Na, 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 I just remember so little about, about about everything. I mean, I I remember one of the first tours we did in uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, we were in Amsterdam. It was utterly horrendous. We had to take food with us, and we stayed in a, this uh, I don't know this this house that the bathrooms didn't work. They were all overflowing. It was absolutely gross, and we had to keep uh, all our vegetables underneath the sink in the kitchen. And there were rats. It was just just her, and we had to share this place with other bands um it was just a nightmare and uh i remember these, that these these sound like the early beatles stories <laughs> you know pl playing eight sets a night and you know all that stuff you know yeah yeah i mean um i i think overall we were we were pretty lucky um when we toured um you know we the tours were pretty good. I mean, other than the early years, the very early years, I think the tours were pretty good. I don't have any horrific memories or about about anything other than other than that Amsterdam thing that was horrible. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, my babysitter went to see Hall and Oates, and you know she came back and told me you know she had seen this concert, and I thought the band's name was Hall Notes, like I had no idea. <laughs> You know, but I realized I was probably 12 or whatever. You guys opened up from that night. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, if I had only known, you know, I was too young to see City Boy at the time, but my babysitter got to see you. So maybe you remember her out in the crowd. I should yeah. doubt it. <laughs> um, I got to well, tell you, the one thing I do remember about touring yep. was um, our road manager, Ralph Simon. He used to buy, <laughs> he used to buy airline tickets cheap that were expiring so that <laughs> they would actually expire before we'd finished <laughs> traveling and then he'd complain the airlines that you know how could they sell tickets that expired you know when he knew all along he was such a hustler so <laughs> we, we definitely got quite a lot of free flights i remember that all right this this sounds a lot like working <laughs> working in the movie business you know it's, it's always okay, a, yeah. on, on a shoestring yeah yeah but uh well I've run through very quickly all my questions. So, okay. uh, and uh, Zoom, is, Zoom is quickly running out anyway. Anything I forgot to ask? Anything you wanted to I share about so. City Boy or uh, you know, any of the cool stuff think you were so. doing back then? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, what, so why do you think, it, I had one more that, you know, why do you think it just never caught on in the U.S.? Because we have bands like Queen and ELO, and they were very English, and we loved them, and they had wacky, strange songs, and yeah. City Boy had the same kind of stuff, and then these great pop songs, you know, mixed in. So why do you think it just never uh, caught on? Yeah, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I, I even to this day, I think The Day the Earth Caught Fire is an absolute classic record. And the band should have been enormous with that record. Yeah. I really do. And, you know, these things happen for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's just meant to be. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's... Um, one, actually, my, my wife's younger brother, um, <laughs> it's one of his favourite albums of all time, that record. And well, it's funny. To, to me, I see the first four City Boy records as one thing. Like that yeah. kind of sounds like the same band. And if you shuffle up all the songs, you can hear something off Book Early, something off the first record, something off of Young Men Gone West. And they all sound like of a piece. And then you have The Day the Earth Caught Fire, which sounds like some supercharged version of this band. Like it just yeah. went up to a whole other level. You know, it's the same band, but it's like, they, you know, got a shot of adrenaline or whatever. And then, of course, you get the record after that, and then it's like something else again. <laughs> totally different yeah. again, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I do, I, you know, I see this thing as like a separate thing from you know the first 
for City Boy Records, just as far as what you accomplished, and it's a concept record and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah. I, I agree, and it's very frustrating being one of the few American City Boy fans, you know, <laughs> because at least in other places, people know you. And hey, in the Philippines, you guys are huge. So, you know, you guys could go to, tour the Philippines and, you know, probably book out you know, a bunch of a uh, bunch of venues. So, yeah, maybe um, we should have moved there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't need to know the amount, but 45 years later, do checks still come in from City Boy or are you still paying off the record company? Um, I don't I don't know. Very seldom I see anything from City Boy. And if it is, it might be like $15 or $20 of something from that comes yeah. from somewhere. Um, but uh I, I don't know if we ever recouped. I mean, I doubt it. I mean, um, the publishing deals, I mean, back then, uh, I mean, 5705, that was, uh, I think, mainly Lol and Steve that wrote that song. So I, I guess I don't know how much revenue that created and how much it paid off. So I don't know if we still owe the record company and the publishing company any money or not. According to the we, we certainly are at Atlantic, but uh, right. But according okay. according to Chris and Steve, it never got paid off, and they you know don't see any of it. And I mean, it's crazy to think you're in debt your entire adult life to a record yeah. company. Like, doesn't this end at some point? Can't we just like you know let bygones be bygones? You no, know, it's just you know you never catch up to. Yeah, and I mean the other thing too is once you get dropped, you know, there's nobody out there really trying to make sure you get whatever's whatever might be owed afterwards. Um, I mean, I do know, for, I, I don't want to stir up a whole bunch of shit here, but I do know Max received some money. So, um, yeah. you know, I guess some money did come in from some from some areas, but, uh, you know, I think, I think I'll leave it at that. All right, well, we're running out. We've got two minutes. So tell us what you've been doing lately. And uh, that'll be um, not a lot, about it. Not a lot. Not a lot. I'm, I'm, I've started working on a new project with a guy in England called Lee Small. Um, fabulous singer and a great writer too. So we'll probably have a project out later this year, towards the end of this year. Uh, we just started on it. Um, so I've been working on that. And other than that, what? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, a couple of years ago, um, maybe more than that. No, it's more than that. About five years ago, I wrote, uh, co-wrote a, a song with uh, Billy Greer in Kansas for one of the Kansas albums. And uh, we, we, we're we really good mates. We keep in touch all the time. And he just called me the other night and said, would I be interested in maybe uh, writing a couple of things with him for the next one? Because they still owe one more album. So uh, so we'll see where that goes. And, and I uh, saw uh, Turkish Delight, which had a bunch of people playing on that thing. Oh, right. Yeah, I wrote that song, Holy Water, with, uh, with Lee Small. So... Uh, yeah, and I do stuff for Khalil, and I, and I guess, I guess the next record will probably be with Khalil too. Well, the, so. the second Turkish delight, you have a song on there too. Oh yeah, no, there's going to be another Turkish. My wife has to keep reminding me. I think so. Um, <laughs> that's who it is. Um, well, tell her, tell, her, tell her thank you again. Hi, Rob. <laughs> hey, thank you again. This was great. Uh, well, at the third stroke, it's one thirty-seven p.m. So, okay. Uh, my my time is running out, but this has been fabulous. Thank you. Like I said, I am a lifelong city boy fan and it's just been great catching up with you so thank well, you thank so much you, for Rob. this thank you very much mate all right enjoy the rest of your day thank you yeah anytime any questions let me know all right <laughs> if i remember i'll tell you <laughs> sounds good all take right care, mate. take care thank you bye. okay bye